Hi, and welcome to this video on how to find a basis for the column space and null space of a matrix. Let's first of all refamiliarize ourselves with the terminology here. A basis for a subspace, remember, is a set of vectors that is both linearly independent and which spans the entire subspace. The column space of a matrix, A, is the space that is spanned by its columns. And the null space of A is the set of all solutions to the equation AX, A times X equals the zero vector. The column space and null space of a matrix are indeed subspaces, as we've seen in earlier videos. And so now we're just going to try to find a basis for each of those two uh, subspaces. So let's start with this simple matrix A, uh, this 3 by 3. And in the green, you see the reduced row echelon form of A, which I've cooked up for you. So first of all, a concept check. Uh, do the columns of A, these three vectors, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 1, and 5, 6, 3, do those form a basis for the column space of A? Think about this carefully, especially the definitions of the terms. Pause the video and make your selection and come back when you're ready. And the answer here, you might be surprised to find out, is no. Not in this case, anyway. Uh, you might cry foul on that by saying, well, wait a minute, aren't, isn't the column space of A precisely that space that is spanned by the columns of A? And you would be absolutely right about that, but to be a basis for the column space of A, we've got to do more than just span the column space of A. It all, I also need to be in a linearly independent set that spans all of the column space of A, and that is not the case in this particular matrix. You can look here at this third column and it gives it away. What this is telling you is that back in the original matrix, this column here is really just 1 times the first column plus 2 times the second column. And you can readily check that. 1 plus 2 times 2 is 5. 0 plus 2 times 3 is 6. 1 plus 2 times 1 is 3. Okay, so the, the set consisting of the three columns will span the column space of A, but that does not form a basis for the column space of A because it's not a linearly independent set. Now, what I can do, though, is slim down this set of three columns to the point where I get a linearly independent set. And that is done simply by removing the one column that, in this case, that is dependent upon the other two. The remaining two columns will form a basis for the column space of A. And here's how I can know that. If I look over in the reduced row echelon form, and I really just need the echelon form here, but in the reduced row echelon form here, what I see in the sort of after image of these two columns here after row reduction is that the two columns are linearly independent. Um, I can see that because of the 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. I don't have any free variables in that little mini system that I have here. So those two vectors are linearly independent. And since the column space of A is the subspace that is spanned by all the columns, I can just remove this redundant vector here in the third column, and the stuff that's left over will span the same space, but will be linearly independent. Okay, so the upshot of all this is that a basis for the column space of A will be this set, the set consisting of the pivot columns in A, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 1. It's not all of the columns of A, but it is all the linearly independent columns of A, and I just had to remove that one that was redundant. And so that's actually going to be true in general. And this is a theorem in your book uh, that if you have a matrix A, to find a basis for its column space, we're just going to find the pivot columns of A, and those will form a basis. So now let's think about a basis for the null space of A. And recall that the null space of a matrix is just the set of all solutions to the homogeneous equation A times X equals zero. So to find a basis for the null space, what I'm going to do is actually just solve this equation and get the general solution for the system AX equals zero, especially written in parametric form. Now I've already got the row reduced echelon form of A here, so this ought to be a fairly quick step here. I'll notice here that X3 is a free variable. And I can also see that x1 is equal to negative x3, and that x2 is equal to negative 2x3, just by work that we've done many, many times before. So now, to find the basis for the null space, what I'm going to do is think about what a general solution vector would look like, x, if it solves, this is the x right here. What would one of those x's look like? Well, it'd have to be a vector in R3, because there are three variables in play here. Okay. But the, uh, so the general solution, which I have going on right here, will help me do a little replacement here. I know that x3 is free, 
and I know that x2 is equal to negative 2x3, and I know that x1 is equal to negative x3. So I'm going to do a replacement like this. Now this is going to let me go into parametric form. I'm going to remove this factor of x3 from the vector that I have here. And what I have left over is a numerical vector. Okay, negative 1, two, negative 2, 1. Okay, so let's just reflect on what this tells me. This tells me that any vector I have that solves the equation ax equals 0 is actually just a linear combination at, of just one vector. And by, when you have one vector, linear combination just means scalar multiple. Every vector that solves the equation ax equals 0 is just a multiple of negative 1, negative 2, 1. Now, what this is going to tell me is that a basis for the null space of A is actually just the set consisting of that one vector that gives me all those solutions. Now let's just kind of think about why that's true. First of all, is this one element set linearly independent? Well, clearly it is. Uh, the only way for a one element set to not be linearly independent is for the one vector inside it to be the zero vector. And you should think about why that's true. So this is certainly linearly independent. And what this result right here is telling me is that this vector spans the entire null space. Every vector that solves this equation up here is can be reached by scaling off this one vector. So that one vector that shows up in the parametric form for your system is actually a basis for the null space. So we don't have a quick theorem for that. We just need to think about when I actually solve the equation ax equals zero, and look at the parametric form of the solution, what I have there are a bunch of numerical vectors, this time only one, but possibly more in other cases, and those numerical vectors form the basis for the null space. So let's look at another example here, one more example, where I have a little bit larger matrix here. So B is this 3 by 5 matrix here in the black, and in the green you see the reduced row echelon form of B, which I got on Mathematica. So let's find a basis for the column space of B first, and then the null space of B. Well, again, to find a basis for the column space, I'm going to look at the pivot columns of B. Uh, the set of all five columns of B will span the column space, but it won't be a basis because five vectors in R3, that's automatically linearly dependent. So I'm just going to look over here at the reduced row echelon form, and I see that the first, second, and third columns of the original matrix, these guys right here, are linearly independent and will form a basis for Actually, they form a basis for everything in R3, so certainly they, will, uh, they can be linearly combined to get these two guys here. So I'm going to eliminate those two from the picture because they depend upon the first three, and that set of pivot columns will form a basis for the column space of A. So again, I'm just going to pick off uh, sorry, the column space of B. So basis for the column space of B, I'm just going to simply pick off the pivot columns from the original B vector. That's negative 2, negative uh, 6, negative 6. Second one is 0, 5, 25. And then finally, that third pivot column, negative 5, negative 14, negative 9. And that's a basis for the column space of B. Now what about the null space of B? Well, the null space of B, the null space of B, which I, again, have B here in its reduced row echelon form, is a set of all solutions to the equation BX equals 0. Let me just write this down. Now, such a solution would not be in R3, it would be in R5. Okay, if uh, x is a solution to this equation, it's got to be five-dimensional. So uh, we don't have a quick theorem for this. Again, what we need to do is go through and just compute the uh, parametric form of the general solution to this uh, system and just try to see what shows up here. So here, uh, the reduced row echelon form tells me that x4 and x5 are free variables. And let's just write down what we know. x4 and x5 are free. I see that x1 is equal to negative 6x4 plus 7x5. X2 is negative one-fifth X4 plus one-fifth X5. And X3 is going to be two uh, X4 minus three X5. Okay, so if I start with, I'll do this up here, if I start with a generic solution to the homogeneous equation, this will have five variables in it, X1, X2, X3, 
x4 and x5. The fourth and fifth variables are free. The remaining three basic variables uh, are tied to the free variables in the way we just wrote out. So I'm going to replace those inside the solution vector. So I'm going to have negative 6x4 plus 7x5. <clears throat> I will have negative 1 fifth x4 plus 1 fifth x5. Uh, 2x4 minus 3x5, and then the final two entries are just x4 and x5. They are free, not determined by anything else. Now what we're going to do here is split this uh, one vector up into two. One vector will have nothing but x4s in it, and the other vector will have nothing but x5s in it. So I'll have negative 6x4, negative 1 fifth x4, 2x4, an x4 and 0, and the second vector will hold all the x5s. That's 7x5, 1 fifth x5, negative 3x5, 0, and 1. I'm sorry, an x5 on the bottom there. Now, if you want, you can do the math here and just add these two vectors and see that you get this one at the top here. Now, what we're going to do next is just factor out the multiples of x5 and x4. So I'm going to have x4 on this first vector. And what's left over are just numbers inside. Negative 6, negative 1 fifth, 2, 1, 0. And the second vector, if I pull out the constant factor of x5, will give me 7, 1 fifth, minus 3, 0, 1. Okay, so to get the basis for the null space, we're just going to form a set that consists of those two, in this case, numerical vectors. These two vectors here will form a basis for the null space of B. And again, why is that the case? Well, what we're seeing here is that every solution to bx equals 0 is a linear combination of these two vectors, and therefore those two vectors span the null space. And moreover, those two vectors are linearly independent. You can really see that if you look at the fourth and fifth entries here, uh, you'll get that linear independence. So this is a linearly, these two vectors form a linearly independent set that spans all of the null space of B, thereby making that a basis for the null space of B. So again, just to sum up the method here, to find a basis for the column space of any matrix, I just go to echelon form and identify the pivot columns back in the original, and those pivot columns will form a basis for the column space. If I want to find a basis for the null space, I need to actually solve the equation ax equals 0 and get it into parametric form, and the numerical vectors that show up in the parametric form will be a basis for the null space.